I got me a theory about the principles of physical locomotion. You know how you test a theory? You take it to the most alien, hostile, extreme place and see if it works there. Welcome to the pool. Well, hell, that's a test of all tests, you ask me. I'm in. And I hate pools. I don't hate swimming per se, but I hate public pools. It's soggy, misty, damp, chlorinated. Like a World War I trench. Call me a conscientious objector. Hippie. So answering questions on swimming is like going into a war zone. But that's why I'm doing it. Have to yourself, gentlemen. This is a view, not a review. It's opinion, not fact. I'm literally making this up. So I'm going to take my bag of tricks and apply it to swimming see what comes up. Right, there are two equations for locomotion. Speed equals distance over time and speed equals stride length times stride frequency. Boring! I think of it like this. The fastest guy is the one who can move the greatest distance in the least time, right? But distance and time are proportional. Unless you find a wormhole. Boring! So the longer the stride length, the longer it takes. So every speed freak out there from walker, runner, cyclist, swimmer, fighter is trying to find the ideal balance between length and the time it takes. Now, I've never sat at the bottom of a pool and watched what swimmers do, though with my lack of flotation, so I wonder why. But with propulsive movement, there's normally an action phase and a recovery phase. In movement without machines, this is normally extension. Now machines are great because they can allow you to propel even in the recovery phase, like, uh, you know, SPDs on bikes. In the recovery phase, this is when you reset for the next action phase. And in natural movement, this tends to be a flexion movement. In bilateral or two-sided movement, you don't have to contend with extra rotational forces. In unilateral or one-sided movement, the more you break the midline, the more rotational force you create, which you have to control. Now, to me, those are the basic rules of propulsion. Now, you take the body and you see what's what. Spoiler alert. Now, I've never spoken to a swim coach, but I reckon that for swimming speed, you need the greatest distance possible to pull over in the shortest time. The action phase is the extension, which happens under the water, and the recovery phase is the flexion, which happens above the water. Now, two of the four strokes are unilateral for the arms and legs, front crawl and backstroke. The other two are bilateral, breaststroke and butterfly. So if you're breaking the midline in either front crawl or backstroke, you're creating extra rotational forces that you need to control. And to swim fast, you need to have the greatest pull under the water and the shortest recovery above the water. Now we come on to greatest pull and we're going to have to hit some trigonometry for a second with a right angle triangle. Boring! The longest sides the hypotenuse and the two short sides are the catheti, or the legs. Uh, uh, let's just call them legs. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Therefore, a longer distance between two points is a curved line. So take the front crawl and backstroke. We want a long pull, which will be the hypotenuse, with a bit of a curve in it for when you're under the water. But remember, the more we break the midline, who's we? I'm not swimming. The more rotational force we've got to control, and the longer the distance, the longer the time. And once your arm's back in contact with the air in recovery, we want the shortest, fastest route back to the beginning of the pull. like a collapsible arm. And as for the leg kick, those legs are always in the water generating propulsion in both hip flexion and hip hyperextension. So you want the shortest line, which is a straight line. Now I wonder what you're thinking. Hold up. How come the arms in the water have an S-shaped long pull and the legs in the water have a straight short pull? The reason is you can propel with the legs in both extension and flexion on both sides. Water acts like a machine. You gonna tell me reasons? So that's the basic maths and physics of swimming. We take these concepts and apply it to the biology of the body, i.e. biomechanics. But that's a whole different video. And I'm gonna need a bigger boat. And final thought, that Veruca foot bath. What chemical, pray tell, is in there so potent that it kills all foot disease dead whilst I'm walking to the pool, but is rendered totally harmless once I dive in. 
And don't talk dilution. When you spot a floating poo, you don't think, ah, oh, there's a poo. Ah, oh, just swim around it. Keep a mouth closed near it. It'll get diluted. I just don't trust those pools. Paranoia aside, pass me a thumbs up, because let me tell you something. Boston makes me feel good. And if you like my vibe, please subscribe. Hey, what about breaststroke and butterfly?